Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, your host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. Um, I'm just going to do a little introduction about who we are and what we are and why we do it uh, before I introduce our co-host and um, our guest today. Basically, Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. And we believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and having everyday conversations about life with dementia, that we can remove the stigmas attached to both memory loss and help those living with the disease continue to live with purpose as well as their care partners. Um, At our core, we also believe that collaboration is the only way that we're going to win this battle against dementia. And I know it's working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares that you've um, so graciously done. And uh, you've had a a huge impact on us um, in getting us named the number one influencer online, according to ShareCare and Dr. Oz. So we really do appreciate you um, liking our radio show, our Facebook page. Um, You know, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, following us, we've got a blog, um, our website, etc. All of those things that you share um, and you push out to your sphere of influence helps it make uh, make it a little bit easier for the next guy to reach out and grab information when they need it. Um, Because there's so many people in our lives that are dealing with this that we don't even know about because they haven't felt comfortable kind of coming out of the closet. They're not quite sure what's going on. And so the more information they see, um, the easier it makes it to be kind of the new normal um, and okay to reach out. So I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for for that. I also want to give a shout out to um, the Call Alert Center, which is a great service uh, if you are trying to protect somebody you love um, who might have dementia uh, with wandering. If they would wander off, they can put together basically a social media blast in less than 10 minutes. It's very inexpensive. You can get information um, just by going to alzheimerspeaks.com and looking on our homepage there. Um, Today we are lucky to have a co-host with me, uh, Lori Shearer, who is living with dementia. And she is just a wonderful voice um, and just lives so graciously with this disease, sharing her insight. So I welcome you today, Lori. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. And I'm I appreciate the opportunity to be on here and and speak with Dr. Smith. Great. Do you want to give people just a little background in terms of how long you've been living with the disease? And In August of 2013, at the age of 55, I was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and FTD, as in frontotemporal dementia. Um, I've spent the past few years, my husband and I, trying to figure out what was triggering symptoms and how to overcome the obstacles so that I can live as independently as possible. Wonderful. Well, um, as we talked, um, I said we we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Macy Smith, and she is a licensed social worker, a certified social uh, work case manager and social worker in gerontology for over 17 years. So she's got lots of experience working with aging and vulnerable populations in South Carolina. She also serves as an adjunct adjunct, um, faculty and subject matter expert um, at a collegiate level in areas of social work and social science and public health. She's appeared in several editions of Faculty Matters magazines for her continued contributions in the academic areas of teaching, discovery, um, integration, and and application. So we're really excited to have her with us today to talk about dementia. So welcome, Dr. Smith. How are you? Doing well. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, the other Lori, for being here as well. I'm excited to be participating today. Well, one of the questions I always ask every guest um, 
and before we get kind of rolling into our, our theme of talk today, is have you been personally touched by dementia uh, with, with any of your family or friends? Yes, my grandmother passed away two years ago from complications from Alzheimer's disease. And uh, just so happened by happenstance, I had already been working in the field and working with adults living with cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but I'll tell you, it looks totally different when it's sitting on your, on your doorstep. There were many times I was at a loss for words, at a loss for strategies, although I had been working with it at that time for 15 years, it just looked totally different. And so my grandmother had a hand in raising me so to better support my dad, who was her primary caregiver, and my sister, who was also her primary caregiver. So you're talking about a couple of generations down. It was, I was a caregiver from a distance, and it was still a challenge. Even though I wasn't there daily, hands-on, caregiving from a distance does, you know, uh, bear a toll on your, your soul, your spirit as well. Oh, for sure. So you, it's interesting when you say, you know, it, it just looks different when it lands on your doorstep. I, I think, I don't think that there's a person that won't um, argue with you on that point. Uh, Lori, what would you say to that comment? Yeah, you know, I, I was only 55, and I was under the stigma belief that people with Alzheimer's were old, um, in a wheelchair, in a nursing home, and didn't recognize anybody. And that was kind of what my vision of what Alzheimer's was. So to be diagnosed and have it being your door, um, it really brings a new perspective to the whole realm of what dementia is. Yeah, I think as society, we really have had a a very limited view um, and understanding of the disease. And that's why it's so great to have as many people advocating and educating and raising awareness out there as possible. Um, Dr. Smith, can you tell our audience um, what is in your, how do you explain to people what the difference is between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Since that's one of the most common questions, I guess we get asked. That is the most common question. And the fact that that question is even asked lets me know that what we're doing, uh, Lori, what we're doing works. Because many years, people thought Alzheimer's disease and dementia was the same thing. It was one and up the same. And as Lori mentioned, there was a stigma, a perception of what Alzheimer's disease and or dementia was. It was an older person's disease. Um, all older people are mean. All older people forget things. It, it, it only applies to older people. And so when someone asks, me what is the difference a light bulb goes off and I say to myself they've been educated in some form or fashion I always say that dementia is the symptom of a medical condition that's impairing one's cognitive state it may not be Alzheimer's disease it could be frontal temporal as Lori stated it could be vascular it could be dementia with Lewy body or it could be a reversible cause of dementia, such as a urinary tract infection, vitamin deficiency. And so I say dementia is a symptom that's caused by something impairing the brain. Alzheimer's disease is the number one cause of dementia. I, I, I attend that to going to the doctor with a fever. When you go to the doctor and you have a fever, after you walk out of that doctor's office, after you pay $1,472.22, is the doctor going to have fever on your paperwork? No, he's going to have what's causing the fever. So the symptoms, fever, dementia, what's causing it. That's what physicians and doctors and family members need to talk about. If my loved one has dementia because they can refer to it based on the symptoms, the next thing you have to ask is what's causing it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Uh, I, I think that that's a good breakdown. Um, so I appreciate you, you telling us that. Can you tell us... Um, what has been the most challenging work that, that you have seen in, in working with the, you know, the area and the population of dementia, those both diagnosed and, and family members? I think the most challenging thing that I continue to run into is education. And you mentioned it earlier when you opened the show. We're in the field and we're working and we see the information, but there are pockets of people in communities, rural communities, underserved populations that don't have information readily available. And when it is readily available, it's not as understandable. I think a lot of times professionals don't take the time to assess a person's literacy level, health literacy. Do they understand 
the information that they're giving? Do they understand their diagnosis? Does the family understand how to care for this individual? So having understandable, easily accessible information is one of the barriers that I continue to run into. We as professionals operate in silos. So we are, we're, we're accustomed to working with this population over here, and this program is accustomed to working with this population over here. And as you stated, collaboration is the key to building a comprehensive approach to dementia-capable care. So that information is key. And I always say when you know better, you tend to do better. And when you have that information and that education, the likelihood that family caregivers are going to burn out easily, the likelihood that they're going to increase their risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is lessened due to education. Also, too, just understanding that they are a part of the medical process. We think about the generation, the silent generation and the baby boomers. A lot of times they don't want to question the physician. They don't want to question the doctor. The doctor went to school for so many years, so he or she knows everything. I empower my families and my consumers, and I say, you know your loved one way better than any physician does. And so the information that you can share is going to help that physician do his or her job. You can't do it alone. Very true. This is not something to be tackled alone. And yet so many people um, feel isolated and um, siloed in our society. Um, can you tell us what has been the most um, rewarding work that, that you have found and maybe maybe share a story with us? So uh, you're going to think this has absolutely nothing to do with Alzheimer's. But in school, in elementary school, I always got written up on my report card for talking too much. Macy talks too much. Macy talks too much. One of the most rewarding things that I've taken away from the past 17 years of working in the field is that my talking too much is saving lives. When, when I have participants after a conference or a workshop come up to me and say, where was this information when I was caring for my dad? Where was this information when I was caring for my spouse? I didn't know that if I lowered my voice and if I talked slower and enunciate my words and not take things away from them, empower them, I did not know that my life could change. I had a, a husband share with me not that long ago. He, because of the symptoms of the disease and the behaviors, they, they tend to look like um, as the disease progresses, maybe the way a toddler processes information or their environment, he would actually take things away from his wife. He would actually tell his wife what she could and could not do, so those negative terminologies. And after the first day of one of my sessions, he said, oh, my God. He said, I have been doing it wrong all these years. He came back the next week. We continued to talk about communication and better understanding the causes of the behavior. He said to me, my wife and I, who I love dearly, have a better relationship because of the information you shared with me. It was okay that now I understand that I was doing it wrong, but now I have a better way of doing it. And so basically we don't teach people to look at the negative. We teach them to look at the positives. It's not about forgetfulness at this point. It's about forgiveness, forgiving yourself for not doing it correctly. Nobody really knows. It's not a, a right or wrong way. Everybody has strategies and tools and tips that they've tried. But also forgive that person for saying something that may have hurt someone else's feelings because they're processing their environment the same way you and I process it. You know, similar to if we have we're stressed or we have anxiety, we're not going to think clearly. We're going to say things and do things that may not be appeasing to someone else. But with a, a fully functioning, accommodating brain, we can accommodate for that. If someone has a cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease or frontal temporal, as the disease progresses, if that environment is not set up to where it's familiar and comfortable, then there's going to be a moment of um, aggression, of anxiety and agitation, and it's going to be difficult to accommodate that because the thinking process is affected. But I always tell people the person doesn't change you know they would tell me you know mom is different she's not my mom anymore well yes she is because her feelings doesn't change you always have feelings and you know how you can see somebody and you may not remember exactly what they did 
but you always remember the way they made you feel, that never changes. And so just to encourage people that your loved one is still there because they have the same feelings that you and I have. Mm-hmm. So what, what it takes is for us to, to set the stage and, and build an environment to where it's appeasing to them. They may not be able to change, but we surely can, and we should. I agree. Um, one of the things you had talked about was, um, you know, relationships becoming closer, you know, with that example. Lori, did you see a change in your relationship with your husband in terms of your dementia? Um, I did. At first it was challenging. Um, and then we actually grew a much stronger bond as we together try all the time to figure out how to improve life. So I think our relationship has grown actually closer. Yeah, I think that that's pretty common, um, you know, from what I hear from people, um, you know, when I go out and speak as well and and talking with people, um, it's really one of those gifts kind of wrapped in this disease that's that's unexpected and um, and really puts a a softness and a, a whole different layer to to illness, um, no matter what it is. But I I think. I think when we're in crisis, um, if that is health-wise or not, it makes us look at life um, in a whole different light with that. Um, Macy, is that something that you continually see with um, with your clients? You know, I'll, I'll tell you, Lori, it kind of um, waxes and wanes. It just depends. As a social worker, we always assess family dynamics. Um, if the relationship wasn't so great, before the disease, then it's going to be even more so challenging. So you tend to build upon the type of relationship that was already established. Um, But I think when you compare someone living with dementia, when you compare what they're experiencing through your own shoes, the same thing you experience when you don't get enough sleep at night, you're, you're not the brightest apple on the tree when you wake up the next morning. I mean, that's normal aging. When you're stressed, you're going to make some bad decisions. When you have high anxiety because you're worrying about something, you're not going to do things right or that's typical to the general population. That's the same way. So when you look at what you experience in a brief moment, just imagine someone experiencing that long periods of time, days, months, years. And so when I put it into perspective and something that they experience on a daily basis, of the, the bells go off and they, they become more empathetic than sympathetic at this point because they can relate. Now, a lot of times you, gotta, you, you have to really help people relate to a situation that may seem foreign. You've got to bring it closer to home because you experience it every day. But we call it normal aging. But what if it's not? Can you kind of uh, understand what the person is going through and what they're feeling and why they're responding the way they're responding? You know, people talk about challenging behaviors all the time. I don't consider behaviors challenging. They're responsive. They're responding to some type of stimuli in their environment. And so as the caregiver or the care partner, are you stimulating negative behaviors or are you stimulating positive behaviors? Mm -hmm. Which is, is very, very true. Anything you want to add there, Lori? Well, it was interesting you, you mentioned responding to some kind of um, stimulus. Um, I had an issue where every night I was having a difficult time. I was becoming very confused. And we found that it was something as simple as a double light switch, where I normally mm. turn off the light if it was already in the up position because it had been turned on at the other end. My head mm-hmm. would not wrap around how to turn that light out. Mm-hmm. And again, that's a stimulus. My mm-hmm. head was was flipping because of the stimulus of the light switch being in the wrong direction and mm-hmm. and different things definitely stimulate a huge response. Mm-hmm. And, and Lori, I'm so glad you mentioned that because you, you said a key word here. You said as simple as we have to begin to think concretely. We have to begin to think simplistically. We tend to overthink things. And when we overthink things and over process things, then we can't figure out, we can't do any problem solving because we're thinking too, too advanced about it. And when you talk about, I have the same light switches, and that bothers me as well. If it's cut on at the other end and this end looks like it's supposed to be cut off, I want to know who did it. Who did it? And I'm fussing, you know. 
and I don't have a cognitive impairment, but daily life, daily stressors exist. And so we all have our preferences. And if things are not lined up just the way, just so, we're going to experience anxiety and stress. And, and, you know, our mind is going to roll because it's not the way we remember it to be. Very true. Very true. And so much is, uh, you know, like Lori said, the, the simple little things, but we have to pay attention to those triggers because everybody is processing you know, basically using the same equation, they're just coming up with with different uh, different patterns, um, right. and um, and the small details uh, make a huge impact. And yeah. you know, when we've got our full cognitive abilities, you know, we can we can justify and say, okay, let that go. Um, you know that that's yeah. not important. But as as dementia symptoms increase, uh, that's not easy to do anymore. And so we have to really kind of put on our our little investigative hats and try to figure out, you know, how do we rework this? How do we how do we keep the calm and the comfort? And most of the time, you know, it, there's there are easy ways to make changes and and adapt. And a lot of people say, well, you know. We have to do it the same old way, but really in life in general, we're always adapting. I mean, if we're honest, we're always adapting to make life easier. And so why should that stop when somebody um, has a disease, you know, and really needs our help? Um, They might not be able to do it all alone anymore. So um, Mm -hmm. for us to support them through that, I think, is a real critical, critical step. Um, Dr. Smith, can you tell us, you know, I know you work with a lot of different types of um, support groups to, um, you know, help help families. Can you tell us a little bit about what types of um, support you see that are available and in what you specifically participate in? So with, with families, I realize that they want practical strategies. They want practical tips. They want information to help them get mom to take a bath or get dad to eat dinner. And so um, what I found most helpful um, are some of the online education programs and also face-to-face CARES, C-A-R-E-S, is an online education program that I, in order for me to recommend it to someone, I have to have taken it and experienced it myself. You know, I think that's a really good program because it gives you practical scenarios that you can relate to in your own life. The trainings that I do, I have some quick tip videos online on YouTube under Dementia Dementia Speaks, but I do face-to-face engagement across the country because what happens is having a group of people who are experiencing the same things you're experiencing or have experienced, they can actually share some practical tools and tips and strategies that you can actually take home with you. Then you know that you're not alone. Typically, when I do trainings, I ensure that there are family caregivers there and that there are also uh, resources there, such as social workers, such as nurses, physicians, because a lot of times our families have questions about treatment and medication. We have trainings in the community in places of resource, such as assisted living facilities. When I tell people what could potentially come as a result of this disease, I need for them to walk out of my training or any training with practical tips, respite. Caregivers need a break. They need respite. They need time away. And sometimes that's very difficult because loved ones, they feel guilty by taking care of themselves. But if they don't take care of themselves, who's going to take care of their loved ones? We had, what The percentage rate is anywhere from 45 to 50% family caregivers pass away before the person living with a chronic illness. And that's because they're giving everything that they can to their loved ones. So respite is a really big deal. Accessible uh, education is a big deal. Um, Bringing training opportunities to the communities that need it the most. Um, In the aging research that I do, we know that Hispanic population is two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than their Caucasian counterparts. We know that African Americans are two to three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than their Caucasian counterparts. We know this, but what are we doing? What are we doing about it? And so I make it a, I make it a conscious effort to ensure that these education opportunities are taken to those communities. So that way, it's easily accessible. And so I think it's, I think it's very, very, very key, the information. Now, do you find um, when you go to the different communities um, that you have to approach the topic a little bit different 
Um, I know culturally, um, you know, there can be some barriers um, in terms of comfort level, in terms of speaking and and um, going public on this topic. Have you have you found that? Um, I I haven't, and I'm gonna tell you why I haven't. I could have been faced with it, but I think it's the way you approach the situation. If you're not laughing, you're crying. So I use humor a lot in my education opportunities and seminars because you want to make it okay to talk about. When, when You know, there's a stigma in certain communities. There's a stigma in African-American communities. There's a stigma in Hispanic communities. But I go in like there's no stigma. It's everyday life. Again, it's what you compare it to. When you compare something that's so foreign or, or taboo, when you compare it to something that's uh, typical, then you have people open up more about it. I'll tell you that when, when doing education opportunities in the Hispanic community, when I begin to talk about the facts um, in terms of brain deterioration, that's alarming for people. Um, but by the time I'm done and I re- you got to bring it all together, you can't just leave them hanging and say, hey, this is a really bad disease because it depends on the way you approach the situation. When you leave them with something that they can do something about, that's what people want. People want to be able to do something about a situation. So when you leave them with hope, they're more apt to come back. And so you're right. There are cultural barriers, but I don't see those barriers. Okay. Because if I focus on the barriers, then I'll, it, it will impede my ability to relay my message the way it should be relayed. Okay. Because I, I know that there's a lot of organizations that are still trying to get uh, more cultural diversity um, within their groups. Um from just community education is, and as far as research goes. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in one of those... Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. One of the things I was going to say, because it, it can definitely be a barrier, a lot of times whatever community you're going to, whoever is leading the, the, the program should be able to relate to them, either talk like them, look like them, or have experienced the things that they've experienced. And so I have a wide range of volunteer trainers that I tap into to go into certain communities that will be receptive because you people aren't going to come if they don't think that you speak their language, that you know what they've experienced. You know, I, I'm a proponent of if you're going to talk to me about something, I need you to do more than just research. Mm-hmm. Research informs practice. But practice also informs research. When you have both of those elements together, you have a bomb. And you could really, really affect change. And so to bring someone in to deliver information that's a part of that community is very key to get the the engagement from a diverse population. Oh, I I totally agree. Um, Lori, do you have any comments on this topic? I I think looking at life with laughter is definitely the the only way to survive. I have, when I was diagnosed, I had many friends that kind of, they're afraid. They don't know what to say to you. They don't know how you're going to act, how they should act, what to say. And I found that oftentimes just when you do something or when you find, when you're told you repeat it yourself five times, you just laugh and go, oh, well, there I go again. Are you used to it yet? (laughs) Oh, well, there I go again. Are you used to it yet? Um, Or, something to try and put them at ease because they are petrified just knowing that I have it, that it, they're, they're afraid. Mm-hmm. So laughter is a, a really good key. Um, can I interject a question here? Sure. Um, you talked about education and I, one of my questions is, do you find that the doctors are well educated in making a complete diagnosis it, in it, it seems as though so many of them just label it Alzheimer's without further uh, cluing into whether it's really Lou body or or frontotemporal mm-hmm. or vascular um, mm-hmm. it seems it, it's just a common label and uh, educating the doctors um, I don't know I, I have found to be a challenge do you see that mm-hmm. at all Yes, ma'am. Uh, and research actually supports that doctors are are not trained specifically to work with an aging population with dementia. I work with one of the leading geriatricians here in, in South Carolina, and he says to me all the time, he says, Macy, if somebody comes in with Alzheimer's disease, I'm going to give them a pill. They come back, you know, three months later with some of the same symptoms and it's getting worse, I'm going to give them another pill. 
we need help working with the families on the social aspect and the emotional aspect. Physicians, they, they focus on the clinical aspect and they focus on the physical. Um, but in terms of providing an in-depth or a conclusive diagnosis, really the only way to determine if a person has Alzheimer's disease conclusively is on, on autopsy. Other than that, it's a game of exclusion. Physicians are practicing medicine, and the operative word here is practicing. And so I think that the family member and the person living with the disease should ask the doctor questions, should do their own research as well. And I promise you, if you ask the doctors questions, they'll look into it because they want they want that. The physicians see thousands, hundreds, if not thousands of patients um, on a monthly basis. And so, you know, they're going to forget things. They're going to forget to check things. You know, I tell families, you know, and I'll go to the doctors with them sometimes and I say, can we do a, a new check for nutritional imbalance? Can we check for urinary tract infection? Um, can we, can we look at their sleep patterns to figure out um, what could be potentially causing this problem? And so when you think about the amount of time that you spend in the back with the doctor, and I think some research supported maybe five to eight minutes, in the back with the doctor, is that truly a lot of time to make a, a, a comprehensive evaluation of a person? It's really not enough time. So when you look at the, um, the facts that relate to the type of care that you receive from the medical doctors, absolutely, they need support. They do, and they need more education for residences coming out of, out of school on how to work with the aging population and their families and better understand uh, the dementia process, and I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to say that they don't want to do it because I. I think for the most part they do want to do a full workup, and then you also have to consider the the person's um, financial resources. Is there? Do they have adequate insurance to be able to pay for all this? The, all these tests and things of that nature. Do they have access to an appropriate doctor? We think about rural communities. If there's only a podiatrist in the community, and that's who they can get to, that's probably where they're going to go. And if you look at the research, we don't have a lot of uh, geriatricians in the country. Based on our needs, we just don't have a lot of doctors that specialize in the aging population. That's very true. And I think that that's a, um, a huge concern for us, that we don't have enough um, specialists in this area. And, um, and yet the population is growing and expanding. And um, hopefully that will change and pe- there'll be more interest um, in this area, and that education will get expanded. Because I know, Lori, um, we've had a lot of um, discussions on dementia chats. In fact, we dedicated one um, just to the diagnosis process and what people went through and how it affected them and their family and what they'd like to see because of the lack of education or consistency um, out there um, in the medical field. And, and hopefully that will that will change. I'm actually working with a, uh, a software company that hopefully will help as well get people resources um, in a much faster, easier fashion that I think uh, clinicians will be able to tap into as well as family. And that we're hoping that's going to launch here uh, in March, um, hopefully the beginning of March. So I'll keep you posted on that one because I, I do think that okay. that will, I think those Good. resources in the community are just critical and and not just in the community but you know nowadays with social media there's so many different types of support um that can happen i know you you've talked about some of the different types of support but but in addition there's the the social media connections the facebook groups for people as well um just to kind of have um have that lift where they can they can vent they can rant um and yet they can be lifted and um share resources and and everybody understands in a respectful uh fashion um Dr. Smith what do you think about a lot of these uh Facebook groups and in social media uh connections that people are making for the disease Um I think it's amazing I I just got on Facebook a year ago and the the outreach that I've gotten since being on Facebook, it's like a whole nother world out there. I I think it, it's definitely an empowering opportunity, as you stated, it gives family members and people living with the disease a, a mode of outreach. They can, you know, let it all out and at the same time receive support from people who live millions of miles away, knowing that they're not alone. So it, it does send a powerful message um, in and of itself. 
even for, you know, I have some families who are not computer savvy, but their grandchildren are, uh, their neighbors are. And so once they find out, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to go directly to the person who's not computer savvy. Somebody in that family can say, this is readily available for you. And so to be able, you said you were working with a software company, but to be able to have apps that all they have to do is touch on mm-hmm. and the community pops up and all they have to do is read and hit a button and they can type and it's an outlet. Everybody has emotions. Everybody wants an outlet. We're human. Caregivers are human, just like anybody else. So we're going to get tired. We're going to get frustrated. But the key is not to let that frustration be directed toward the person that's actually living through the disease process. And so they have to have an outlet. Yeah. If they don't have that, we're doing a disservice. Well, and I think not just for the the care partners, but for people living with dementia as well. Um, I, I think that they mm-hmm. get um, huge support um, through that, like dementia mentors, where they can hook up with somebody who's heard those words and, and live that um, life and uh, know what exactly it feels like. Um, I, right. I just I just think that that is incredible, you know, what is happening around there. Um, I wanted to ask you, I can't believe our time is going so fast here. If you were to make some changes to the current state of dementia care, what, what would that be? And why would you, why would you make those changes? One of the changes that I would make if I had my own world, which I don't, is the requirement for professional caregivers, direct support staff, direct care partners. In our country, the standards that are set for what staff should have in terms of education is very minimal. And so, you know, there are times when our families, you know, families can't provide the care that's needed for the person living through the disease process. And so we look to assisted livings and nursing homes and different types of communities. And so we are entrusting our loved ones with someone to provide the most intimate care Uh, for some of our most vulnerable populations. And so not to invest in dementia-competent training for direct support staff and and care partners is is quite negligent. And so families want to feel secure that their loved one is taken care of, someone living through the disease process. They want to know that this person or that these people are going to take care of me. They want to know that they're in a safe place. And so for states, I just really feel that there should be more uh, stringency and more a definitive outline of what direct support staff and dementia care partners should look like. I think it should be a a specific curriculum identified. It simply says training. What type of training? You're going to print an FAQ off of the Internet and have them sign it, that's training. That's not good enough for me. I encourage my families to ask, you know, different communities, what type of training does your staff get on dementia-capable care? I want to see the curriculum because, again, I want to be secure in knowing that you're going to take care of my mom, that you're going to take care of my dad, that you're going to take care of me because I never know when I'm not going to recognize you or recognize where I am. This better understanding to ensure that they, their space is familiar, their space, their space is comfortable and safe. That's a big deal. I often tell people, you know, how you travel and you uh, you go to the your, your hotel room after driving all day and all night. You take a shower, you get in bed, you go to sleep, and you wake up 3 o'clock in the morning confused, don't know where you are. You got to look around for a second to process it. For that moment, for that second, how do you feel? You're scared to death. Now, just imagine feeling that all the time. Mm-hmm. What changes would you make? hmm mm-hmm. Yeah. Lori, what about you? Is there anything that you'd like to see changed? I, yeah, I'd like to see the healthcare industry as a whole come up with more options to give people either when they're diagnosed with any form of dementia or when their loved one is diagnosed and let them see that there are many options. As far as the chat groups, as far as the things available online and something other than just Um, the Alzheimer's Association, because there's so many other things out there. And yet that's not, that's not made available. Um, It's not readily available to people diagnosed. And that was what the Facebook programs are really what changed my life. Mm -hmm. I had gotten the doom and gloom speech and thought I was ready to die. And uh, meeting other people and talking to other people 
with dementia really helped me to learn. I've learned more about dementia and my symptoms and how to take care of them from people online than the doctors have ever given me. Mm-hmm. But yet nobody promotes those groups. And it needs to, I shouldn't say nobody, because you do. <laughs> um, most people don't promote those groups. And yet for caregivers and people with dementia, they can be a lifesaver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the things that, that I worry about um, with uh, the curriculum is, and I, and I understand where you're coming from, uh, Macy, on that, is that a lot of people can go and pass the test, but that doesn't mean that they have swallowed the concepts or, or give a crap about them, <laughs> you know, to exactly. be, to be, to be oh, really blunt. And so yeah. um, I think, you know, to me, cause, and I also think that everybody is trying to be the silver bullet. They want to be the program. And mm-hmm. I would really like to see us walk away from that attitude and say, mm-hmm. you know what, you need everybody's program. You need as much mm-hmm. knowledge as mm-hmm. you can, yep. because, you know, we always say yep. once you've met one person with dementia, you've met one. But the same thing goes for a care partner. The same thing goes for the environment. And yep. we need toolkits and we need to stop yep. competing with one another and embracing what everyone else is doing and sharing knowledge on a on a simple level that connects with people. I loved what you had said when I had asked about, you know, the cultural differences and stuff. And you're like, well, they need to know you get them. You know, they, they need to know you're not talking at them, that you're walking Mm -hmm. with them. And, and that makes a huge, huge difference. And so for me, that would be one of the greatest changes that I would like to see is more collaboration um, and yeah. people stop worrying about ownership and just mm. touching people's hearts. Um, I, I personally think that we don't change um, until we feel the need at a heart level. You know, we can get it um, psychologically, you know, uh, in our mind. We can understand that, oh, I have to pass the, I have to be able to recite the mission statement in case I'm quizzed, you know, when the owner comes walking down the hall. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean someone's compassionate. That doesn't mean anybody's learned any empathy um, or, you know, that they know how to interact with people. Um, and to me, it's about having a, a safe environment to be able to have a vulnerable conversation um, that's honest because I think all of those conversations um, as we allow people that, that safety net to rest, um, they are teaching others um, what it's like, what it feels like, what it looks like, um, what they want out of life. And then it allows the next person to go, you know what, I could do that too. I could be vulnerable. I could be authentic. I, I finally have a safe place to do that. Because I think until we get to the root of what is safety, what is comfort to somebody, we can't give good care if we're mm-hmm. really not asking um, those those honest questions. And I think as facilitators and teachers and medical professionals and, you know, whatever advocates, we also have to share that vulnerability. We have to, we have to set the stage to have those authentic conversations. Um, Because I know I learned so much from my audience um, every single time, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and, and knowing that you're not being talked to, but you're being talked with, you know, that it, that it is a conversation and it is a moving target. And I, I, to me, as a daughter who lived with it, you know, with my mom for 30 years um, through this disease, I found great comfort in just being able to be honest. And um, no one had to fix it, but I just needed to know that they understood. And that soothed my soul. Um, uh, Lori, does that make sense to you at all, what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And... and um, Dr. Smith, what do you think about those comments? I I wrote down several of them because if we were in church and we don't have to be, but I was over here saying, amen, amen. I always (laughs) tell people before I start anything, look, I'm not an expert. I get nervous when anybody ever says that because it makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. I learn from other people. And I always say, if I don't learn something today, from talking with you all, I didn't do my job. Whenever you're an expert and you can't learn anything else, you're no longer useful in this field is, mm-hmm. is how I look at it. Um, and you talked about safety. You know, I always talk to, to my folks about the difference between safety and well-being. And I ask them, which one trumps the next? They usually say safety. 
But that by the time we're done, it's well-being. Mm-hmm. They have to work collaboratively. It, it, it's an iterative process because if I'm not happy in a place or in a space, I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. But because I have dementia, you call it eloping, exit-seeking, wandering. No, I'm leaving a place that I'm not comfortable in. Mm-hmm. And so when we better understand who the person is, who they were prior to being diagnosed is the same person they are after being diagnosed. It's just going to look a little differently, and it's going to take some altering on your part. You know, it's, it's, it's not about, you know, memory loss. It's about memory preservation and self-preservation. So how are you going to do that? Um, and, and that's what and that's what individuals cry out for. What do, what do you think about that, Lori? I know I didn't have any chance to ask any questions, but you know I just love hearing you talk. What do you think about that? What, what would you want someone to help preserve your memories and preserve who you are, as opposed to saying what you're not going to be and what you're not going to become because of the disease process? Absolutely. I you know I've had so many times that my family has said, "Well, you can't do that." And my husband and, and I have said, we didn't try to overcome the obstacles yet. We can't say we can't do that. Exactly. Um, I think that's in so much of dealing with this, the first step is to give up. And therefore, you're giving up your well-being because you're just saying, oh, for safety reasons, I can't, I can't, I can't. But in many cases, you can find what's triggering it. What is what is the obstacle that people say you can't do it? Um, for example, traveling. Uh, I wanted to go to a conference, and my sister was, you can't do that, you can't do that. Well, we found my obstacle was in the airport. I get lost in the airport. So we called TSA. We called the airline. They get me to the gate. Okay, what's the next opti- obstacle? And through the whole trip, before I left, we worked out, what all the obstacles were that people were saying I could not do this trip because of, and we took mm-hmm. care of them and I was able mm-hmm. to do the trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think with people in all stages of any type of dementia, we, we tend to automatically go with, they can't do that. And often what we need to do is just take time and sit back and improve their well being and let them do the mm-hmm. things they want to do. Just figure out how. Mm -hmm. independence. I always tell people you have to shift your focus. It's not about what they can't do, but what do they need in order to be able to do it? Exactly. Absolutely. Shifting your focus. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I just, uh, I, I have one last question for you, and then we've got to wrap up here. Um, uh, Dr. Smith, how do you get community involved in dementia awareness? Uh, Visibility. Visibility, it, you, you mentioned ownership. People want to own a particular program. People want to own a particular service. Whenever there is ownership and, and silos, the people who need it the most, they actually suffer. So making things available, being visible, being vulnerable yourself. You talked about social media. Well, that's free advertisement right there. Get the information out there. Talk about it. Share your story. Share your experiences. The more people see it, the more people hear it, the more they're more apt to talk about it themselves. And again, you have to have representation of all cultures, of all communities, of all uh, populations, and talk about it, be about it, and be visible on an ongoing basis. You know, my tagline is dementia speaks, don't mind me. I don't care what I'm training about. I could be training about med passes. I'm probably going to say something that's going to shock you, but dementia speaks, don't mind me. Because mm-hmm. I got to keep you engaged just like I want you to keep me engaged. And so I often feel like when I have a stressful day or if I say something that doesn't quite make sense, or sometimes I just don't feel like thinking. That's okay. And I, I, I live my life thinking, is this what someone living with dementia experiences? Is this what my grandmother experienced? And so I just I, I start to be it. I start to live it. And once it's okay to talk about, as Lori said, you know, looking at life with laughter. That's really the only way to be. You ward off so many diseases laughing and smiling, but just being visible, talking about it, and being vulnerable is, is, is the way that I think that you can get communities involved and just keep at it. I always say, if you know, we talk about legislation all the time and bringing about more funding for respite and more funding for research. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, how the numbers keep growing for Alzheimer's disease, but the money for, for research is just, stagnant. The numbers grow in terms of the diagnosis, but 
it, not until it hits someone on their front doorstep. And I always say when it hits them, they'll know that you're there because you stayed visible, you stayed engaged, and you stayed vulnerable. Okay, wonderful. Well, I want to let our audience know um, that they can get a hold of Dr. Macy Smith uh, by contacting her through her website, dtconsultant.org. That's dtconsultant.org. Or they can email her at info at dtconsultant.org. Thank you, Dr. Smith, uh, for being with us today. Really appreciate your your perspectives um, on dementia and caregiving. And Lori, it's always a pleasure to have you with us as well. So thanks for being my co-host today. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. For those of you. Enjoyed it. For those of you who are new to Alive in Social uh, Network here, you might want to check out one of my sidekicks here. They have a show called What's for Dinner Tonight, and that's with Rachel Perrin, who is the culinary director for Kowalski's Market, along with her sidekick, uh, Adam Lee. And they talk about all kinds of seasonal foods and um, trending topics and nutrition, everything kind of yummy for the tummy. Um, Their podcast is only 10 to 15 minutes long, but if you're busy and yet hungry, it's a great way to kind of figure out your dinner plans. You can also go to uh, kowalskis.com. and find a full selection of uh, their their seasonal menus. And Kowalski's is K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I-S dot com. That's Kowalski's dot com. If you haven't listened to some of our other shows, you might want to go back. We've been doing this for years, so we have tons of podcasts. Um, the last one we uh, did was called Lights Love Can Remove the Darkness of Dementia. And it's a fascinating story of a, of a son uh, caring for his mother. Um, we also talked about music as a gift in creating joyful moments. Uh, we had Dementia Raw Training on, who is unscripted and unconventional. And they're just a, a blast. I got to meet them when they were here in Minnesota. And then when I was in, in Indiana, I got to see them there as well. Uh, let's see. I, I need to give a shout out to uh, Clarendale of Sherville and uh, Mo, Mokina and Al- Algonquin um, for their hospitality. They hosted screenings of the Hollywood film, His Neighbor Phil, and we just had a marvelous response. And I'm looking forward to going back and, and doing some more work in their communities as well. Our last dementia chats, uh, we had a great conversation about moving and construction and remodeling and how that can affect a person with dementia. So check check out the Dementia Chats videos. Uh, they are where I interview people with uh, dementia. They are our experts, and they just have some wonderful insights. If you're in Minnesota, I've got a couple of um, screenings of His Neighbor Phil coming up on March 6th at St. Therese in Woodbury, and then we're going to do another one May 20th at St. Therese in Woodbury again. People keep wanting to bring people back once they've seen the film, so it's really a lot of fun. On our blog, we got a lot of uh, great response to a um, an article called Valentine's Day uh, the side not always talked about, the beautiful side, or the, the darker side, um, which t- uh, highlights a really beautiful poem on grief, and it might be something you want to look at. There was also an article by uh, Karen Brenner, the author of You Say Goodbye and We Say Hello, which happened to be another poem called a Caregiver's Valentine, which is is quite nice. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, mark your calendars for November 11th. We're going to be doing a uh, cruise, um, which will be dementia-focused, and it will be going to the Bahamas. And I'll be getting more information out to you on that, but it will be for both uh, the person with dementia who is still able to travel and their care partners. We're looking at really having a a great time with that. So um, until next time, have a wonderful week. Talk to you soon. Bye now. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire, become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.